Hello and welcome back to Creek Church Online as we are continuing our journey through the book of Genesis. Uh, we have moved through the four events that open up the book, creation, fall, flood, and the nations. And now we are getting ready to go into the focus on four people. The first of those four people is a man by the name of Abraham, or Abram as he starts out being. And so we are in the book of Genesis. We are in chapter 11. And we hope to begin today in uh, in um, verse, um, we're going to be looking at the section in chapter 11. Uh, I think we'll be reading from um, verse 27 is where we'll try to pick it up today. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you want to keep them open and, and look at your Bibles because there's a lot uh, to uh, what we're seeing, uh, actually, we'll begin in verse 10 of chapter 11 because we focus in on Shem. And um, we've already looked at uh, Japheth and we've looked at Ham's descendants and we're focusing in on Shem. And there's a particular reason which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. You can hit the drop down. You should be able to pull up the notes and uh, be able to print those out and follow along as we work through uh, this whole section dealing with Abraham. It's one of my favorite sections in the whole Old Testament, actually. I, I love uh, the life of Abraham. There's so much about Abraham and his life that we have to understand, or if, if not, we will lose, uh, we'll lose sight in the significance of what the Bible is saying throughout the Old Testament and even into the New. You really have to understand the life of Abraham to really understand the essence of the gospel and what it is that God is doing and how he's uh, in the gospel. He is fulfilling the covenant of, uh, of Abraham. So let's uh, begin by going to the Lord uh, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this day and this time that we have to study your word. We pray that you would open it up to us, and Lord, that you would help us to focus upon your truth and that you would be glorified, Lord, in us as your covenant people. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, encourage us, strengthen us, and Lord, just challenge our thoughts about you, and Lord, we want to think rightly and correctly about you and who you are and what you've done throughout history, so we commit this time, Lord, into your hands, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. We are in Genesis chapter 11, and we begin here in verse 10. And we see these words. These are the generations of Shem. When Shem was 100 years old, he fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 430, 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber, and Sheila lived after he fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived uh, 34 years, he fathered Peleg, and Eber lived after he fathered Peleg 430 years and had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu, um, and Peleg lived after he fathered Reu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Reu had lived 32 years, he fathered Sarug, and Reu lived after he fathered Sarug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Sarug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor, and Sarug lived after he fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor had lived 29 years, he fathered Terah, and Nahor lived after he fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So let's stop right there. Because what we actually see here is we move from the nations uh, to uh, a specific man by the name of Abram. And so the focus then comes from the greater group, those descendants of Noah who came down through his three sons. And then the focus comes through the line of Shem and it goes all the way up to Abram. 
uh, Ham and, of course, uh, Japheth uh, kind of get pushed aside. They have descendants. There's no doubt about that. They are on the earth. Uh, but the focus really uh, comes upon Shem and specifically down through the line all the way to the man Abram. So I say here in the notes, top of page 36, where we see focusing the nations toward Abraham. And of course, Abraham is the, uh, the, the name that God gave to Abram uh, because he would be the father of many nations. So Abraham uh, reflects that covenant promise. So when we talk about Abraham, uh, we're talking about the covenant man. Um, uh, there'll be times where the, the text will say Abram, but in my discussion as I'm teaching, I'll say Abraham. Uh, please forgive me. I, I do this out of habit. Uh, I know I should say Abram because at that point in time, that's who we're dealing with. And I'll try to most of the time, but sometimes I just forget because we're talking about one and the same people. Um, but his name, Abraham, is reflective of the covenant. So notice the differences between 11, 10 through 32, and 10, 21 through 31. Ages are added to 11, 10 through 32. A specific line being followed in 11, 10 through 32. So this is the thing, because uh, Jewish people have this deal about genealogies and you know, they're wanting to be specific and to count that through. Uh, we don't see the ages and everything being depicted in everyone in the, the nations. Um, so there is this specific aspect being tied to the line of Sham. And we go all the way, uh, verses 10 through 26. I'm not going to read it again. Um, we go from Sham to Terah. Shem fathered Akrashad two years after the flood at a hundred years old, Shem lived 500 years, fathering Abishad, 600 years total, and had other sons and daughters. Abishad fathered Shelah at the age of 35. Abishad lived 403 years after fathering Shelah, so that'd be 438 years total, and had other sons and daughters. Shelah fathered Iber at the age of 30, and Shelah lived 403 years after fathering Eber. So it would be 433 years total and had other sons and daughters. Eber fathered Peleg at the age of 34. And Eber lived 430 years after fathering Peleg, 464 years total and had other sons and daughters. At this point, the genealogy of 10, chapter 11, 10 through 32 departs from 10, 21, through 30. The genealogy of Sham in 1021 through 30 follows the line of Joktan, brother of Peleg, while 1110 through 32 fathers the line of Peleg. So there's a parallel going on here. Shouldn't confuse you. Still, we're focusing in on going down into the line of, um, of, of Abram, down to the line of Abraham. So Peleg fathered Reu at the age of 30. Peleg lived 209 years after fathering Reu. It's a 239 year total and had other sons and daughters. Reu fathered Serug at the age of 32. Reu lived 207 years after fathering Serug. That'd be 239 years total and had other sons and daughters. Um, Serug fathered Nahor at the age of 30. Serug lived 200 years after fathering Nahor, 230 years total and had other sons and daughters. Nahor fathered Terah at the age of 29. Nahor lived 119 years after fathering Terah, 148 years total, and had other sons and daughters. So Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, three sons. Abram, Nahor, and Haran at the age of 70. And then we focus in on the line or on the person of Terah in 27. Now, one of the things that you may have noticed is that it seems like, well, it doesn't seem like, it actually is happening where we see that people are living uh, for shorter time spans. They're not living eight, 900 years. They're getting, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And you say, oh, why is that? Well, if you remember back after the flood, the Lord said that from now on, the way it will be is that 
we will have a man's uh, time, his time on earth will be roughly around 120 years. And so because of the evil that was upon the earth and this type of thing, and then after after the flood, that's what God had decreed and said would happen. It didn't happen just like that. I think I mentioned that back when we were looking at that. So it's by way of review. Remember, it didn't just happen immediately. But here you can see a trend where as the generations go on, that we see things just milking down, getting closer and closer and closer and closer uh, to the point in time where you're dealing with, uh, where you're dealing, you're eventually you're going to be dealing with people's lives who are roughly around 120 uh, years or so. So just keep that in mind as we work our way through. Let's pick up in verse 27, and we see here in the text, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot, so remember that, keep that in your mind. Lot is Abram's nephew. Uh, Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah in Iscah. Now Sarai was barren, she had no child, she had no child. Uh, Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So if you look at the middle of the page uh, there on page 36, letter C, the account of Terah. Terah's name means station or delay. Um, Terah's sons, three, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Abram means exalted father. Of course, then Abraham would be father of many nations or exalted father of many nations. Uh, Nahor uh, means snorting. I don't know if that's because he looked like a pig or something like that, but Nahor means snorting, probably uh, not necessarily tied to anything that he did. Of course, he could have been one of those people that snored a lot when he was sleeping, and maybe they referred to him as Nahor for that reason. Haran means mountaineer, and the life and times of Haran we see in Second part of 27 through 28, he becomes father of Lot. So later we're going to see Lot. That'll be Abram's nephew, Lot. And of course, we know this account. He uh, goes to Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, we'll see him talked about there in this whole thing between Abram and his shepherds and Lot and his shepherds, um, that there's conflict between their shepherds and there's going to be uh, some time we're going to spend talking about Lot. So I think the scripture tells us this and fills us in so we can understand the, you know, the family context to uh, um, and how uh, Lot relates to Abram. So uh, Haran becomes father of Lot. Haran dies in Ur while Terah is still alive. Now, if you know any thing about geography of course I'm not really that good at it but if you have the Persian Gulf here and you have the land of Canaan and this is the Mediterranean pretend like and of course you got this the Sinai Peninsula thing you know going on here like this big peace sign and this goes over and um, and uh, I guess I drew that wrong I should probably be more like more like so um, but uh, then you have, this is the Red Sea, this is the Mediterranean, this is the Persian Gulf, and you have Egypt here, and Ur is over in this area, Ur of the Chaldees, and this is one of the oldest cities in, in the world, and of course it has been excavated, the board won't stop moving. Um, and this this whole area right here is desert. Of course, here's here's Palestine or Jerusalem. I'm sorry, and um, or Israel. And uh, this area right here is just it's it's desert. And so they would not travel, uh, you know, across this way. 
uh, they would come up uh, from Ur and come around and travel down like this. Haran is up here to the north. And um, so, so when they travel, this is a trade route from this, uh, this area over here. This is often referred to as the Fertile Crescent. And so people would travel this way when they would go on the trade routes, and those trade routes would come down through uh, what we know the nation of Israel today. And there was two, if I remember correctly, there were two highways about right here. It split, and um, there was the Great Trunk Road, and uh, the other road was the King's Highway, if I remember correctly. And they would split, and one went down on the east side, and one went down on the west side of Israel. And they would then come back together and then the trade could move into Egypt. So trade would go right through the current uh, nation of Israel up over the Fertile Crescent and down to you know the city of Ur. And so Abraham was uh, from this city. Um, of course it was not a, a um, <laughs> it was not a Christian city or a, or a Jewish city so to speak in a religious sense. Um, uh, historians believe that um, Abraham or Abram at this point in time probably was a worshiper of a, of, a, of a moon god of some kind. And so there would have been pagan gods that he would have been uh, worshiping in, in, a, in the culture that he lived in. And uh, we're, we're not told any reason why he ended up going to Haran. We know that things happened uh, as he was moving from Ur to Haran. And so that's where he is uh, when we come into chapter 12. He's in this area right up here. Uh, so he's been journeying um, up over the Fertile Crescent, coming in to Haran. And, uh, of course, that is where the story picks up from the covenant sense and where God speaks to him, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. So if you go back to your notes... Two brothers marry. Abram marries Sarai, princess, and Nahor marries Milcah, uh, which means uh, queen. So uh, Abram married a princess, and um, Nahor marries a queen. And uh, they are indeed, um, Nahor and Milcah are the grandparents of Rebekah. So we'll talk about that later on, and you'll get the, you know, the family tree will come together where you can um, um, kind of see how things were unfolding throughout history. Uh, Milcah was the daughter of Haran, therefore Milcah also would have been Nahor's niece along with her sister Iscah. So Abram's wife, Sarah, was barren. It's interesting, right, that we have this, this mention of her, uh, you know, it mentions her name and then immediately... The thing that the text tells us about her, oh, and she was barren. Uh, you wouldn't think necessarily that that's the first thing you would attach to uh, a woman that you're introducing into a story, but they do here. And if you know the story, and at least the generalities of it, you know why this becomes a huge factor in how God works and what God does in fulfilling his promise. So Milka was the daughter of Haran, so she would have been Nahor's niece along with her sister Iska. So Abram's wife Sarah was barren. So the statement in the narrative sets the stage for the account dealing with Abraham and the covenant promise yet to come. In a similar way, the half-brother slash sister identity is also kept hidden from our reader until chapter 20, 11 through 13. We'll talk more about that when we get there. Uh, but there was also this connection where uh, Abraham or Abram and Sarai were half brother and half sister. So, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So Terah sets out for the land of Canaan, but settles in Haran. So the land of Canaan would have been uh, the area that I drew on the map. Uh, referring to the nation of Israel. That whole area, that land, was referred to as the land of Canaan. And we'll see as we move through Scripture that it'll, the Scripture will talk about the land of Canaan, and that's the area that it's referring to. So he sets out for the land of Canaan, but settles in Haran. That's where he stops. 
That would be north of what is current day Israel. Uh, so Terah took Abram, Lot, and Sarai from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. And they settled in Haran. And Terah dies at 205 years old in Haran. And you're like, wow, he died at such an early age. Well, he may have died at an early age when you consider his background and his lineage. Uh, but we know that the, uh, the line, the time of someone's life, the lifespan of someone's life is getting uh, less and less time on earth because of what God pronounced uh, after the flood. Uh, so we're moving to Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and we will look at verses 1 through 9. So let's look at our text. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we are in verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land, so he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. So, we have here in chapter 12, remember Abram is in Haran and the Lord said to Abram, this is a profound statement because not since the time at least of Noah and uh, the flood and all those events that surrounded that, we have not seen God speak in this way. As a matter of fact, we really haven't seen God speak in this way at all in all of the scripture um, in the sense of the covenant context to this degree. This is something that is somewhat unique. I understand there was covenant connected, the covenant of works. Uh, some theologians like to say the idea of the covenant of grace when God covered them, and certainly we could, we could see that aspect, but here we have something very specific in um, God's redemptive plan in bringing about a covenant fulfillment in the life of his servant Abram. And we have the word said, amar. It should be a familiar word to us, the Hebrew word, because as we went through the whole uh, unfolding of the creation narrative, we saw it over and over again, amar Elohim, and God said, amar Elohim, and God said, God is speaking out uh, commands he is calling creation into existence, and it is coming into existence by the power of his word. And so God's word is bringing those things forth out of nothing. Uh, ex nihilio is the Latin um, idea or the Latin verbiage uh, denotes. So we have here, though, God speaking to Abram in a covenant context. And he is, uh, again, we have the Hebrew word amar. So it is coming from God's mouth. And the content of what he said, verses 1 through 3, second half of verse 1, go. He is to go, to walk, to come, to part. This is an imperative command to Abram. He's not going to be able to just hang out in Haran 
God has a place for him to go, and he commands Abram to do just that. So the Lord is calling Abram out of a spe- for a special divine purpose similar to, to Noah. God had a purpose for Noah. He spoke to Noah. He commanded Noah to build an ark, and he had guidelines for Noah. And here we have him speaking to Abram uh, regarding his plan of redemption. So the constant crimson thread that runs from chapter 3, verse 15 of Genesis, this is where we have what is referred to by theologians as the pre-Evangelion or the pre-gospel, where you have the hostility between the serpent and the woman and between her seed and the seed of the serpent And the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman will bruise, or if you want to take it to an extreme, uh, which you can, because this is what does happen, crushes the head of the serpent. Um, This is the pre-Evangelion, so we have a connection here all the way back to Genesis 3.15, and it connects us into this covenant promise with Abram because there's a redemptive element in this covenant promise. As a matter of fact, the redemptive element in this covenant promise connects all the way through eternity <coughs> in the sense that it, it, it is fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. And so the covenant with Abraham is not done away with in the person and work of Christ. The covenant of Abraham is actually fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. This is why this is so critical for us to understand and to have our history and our understanding of the life of Abram and the covenant promise that was made uh, that we have it clear in our minds because there's so much scripture in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament that makes reference to Abraham and the covenant and the promises that are connected to that covenant. And so if you don't understand that, well, then you're not going to understand what the gospel has actually done. It's not to save you from the wrath of God and reconcile you to God, but there are all kinds of promises of an inheritance that is connected to that. And of course, we can uh, see the whole idea of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ even metaphorically represented in the covenant with Abraham or in the Abraham account where God is interacting with him. So uh, he has to go. He has to head Uh, on his way to the place where God will show him. Uh, Your country, if you look back at your text to um, uh, verses 1 through 3, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So this idea of your country is the uh, Hebrew word heretz, and it just simply is referring to the land that you're in, uh, you know, all his surroundings, where he's at, not necessarily. I mean, could be referred to as a country, uh, but definitely the place where he's at and the surrounding area where he's kind of living, making, uh, making his home at that point in time. God is saying to him that I'm taking you out of this. I want you to go to another place away from this place and away from your kindred so your country this is referring to the area around Haran Uh, Abram along with his father Terah have settled in Haran the Lord's call is one regarding geographical importance Abram is to leave the land he is now in the whole idea of your kindred is connecting also to that family relationship that he had with the people that he was with and so he must leave his kindred his his, uh, his offspring, his relatives. So this is referring to his relatives that journeyed to Haran from Ur and any born in the process up to that point. Uh, the idea of being your father's house, this may very well be referring to the actual dwelling place of Abram. It could have been that Abram was still living in the tents of his father. I think it is very likely in the tent of Terah. It probably also was a place of security during the a time when there was safety in numbers. Kiel and Deitch say this. They say, thus he was to trust entirely in the guidance of God and to follow wherever he might lead him. 
And this is, I think, very crucial for us to stop and take account of because there's a lot of safety and security that Abram probably felt and even in the idea of being with pops and being with dad and being with his entourage and you know the people that would have been with them in their in their uh, their household as a they were living in a patriarchal society so uh, there would have been other people there and they would have had like their own little army and there would have been safety in numbers but here it seems that God is carving out Abram and his household and he is moving him out of that uh, there is a, a real sense, especially in this day and time, that there is safety in numbers. There's more of us than there are of them. And if there's more of us, then we have a certain strength because of our numbers. And so that idea was very much in play in these ancient times. They thought of this a lot more than we do, especially here in the West and in America. Uh, we may think about it if we're ever playing you know, a game like football or something, um, but when you, um, when you realize that it could actually cost you your life to leave the, the, uh, the greater group and to go out on your own, you're smaller in numbers, you become, um, you become, well, you could become a setting duck, so to speak, for someone who was stronger than you or who wanted to overthrow you and take your goods and everything that you had. This is something that was very important in their mindset. Like I said, we don't think that much of it in our day and time, but in this day and time, this meant safety, this meant security, and God is calling Abram, he's commanding him to go, to leave all of that and go to a place where he will show him. So this idea to the land, and notice the contrast by the use of the same word twice in this context. The contrast is between where Abram is in Haran and the place he is being called to go to by the Lord. Notice that when they originally left Ur, the intended destination was Canaan. That's where he was intending to go. But we don't see anything that God spoke to anyone in Ur. We only see God speaking at this point in time in Haran, speaking to Abram. So the command to Abram to leave all hinges, all this hinges on his belief in the one commanding him. So it's a profound statement when you think about it in its context. Um, going to a land that I will show you. So um, he originally left Ur. The intended destination was Canaan, but Haran is the location they settled. So they did not go all the way. But here God shows up and he commands him to go the rest of the way, or at least to a land that I will show you. Now the Lord commanding the now the Lord is commanding Abram to move to another location. Uh, you've heard the idea or the term where uh, you know the that we often use when we refer to people uh, where, where we kind of get set in our ways, or we are kind of um, you know creatures of uh, habit, and we don't want to move beyond where we are. Uh, because we're comfortable where we are. And, well, this is something God is coming into Abram's life, and he is just basically turning everything upside down. And he is taking over. This is a covenant commands. God is speaking to Abram. Uh, I, I just can't even imagine what that would be like. I mean, I've tried many times to put myself in Abram's shoes, but it just seems so difficult. Uh, to think of all that sense of security that I had and the unknown that was out in front of me just being so hard and so difficult to just to just think what he was thinking of, of what that meant for him. Uh, I can imagine it because of what I, you know, the little bit I know about ancient history, um, but yet it, was, it had to be so much more profound and so much more difficult than I can even imagine. Uh, but nevertheless... God is the one who has called him out. And we see the words, I will show you. So there's a designation in place, but it's not necessarily a place where God is saying, okay, you're going to go to Chicago, and or you're going to go to this town or that town. Uh, it's just a place that I'm going to show you. So there's this whole idea of a designated trust that that Abram has to have toward God. And... Um, 
the word show in Hebrew, ra'ah, and it means to see, to look at, inspect, perceive, consider. So the verb is hifel and perfect. <clears throat> Therefore, grammatically, and hifel and perfect doesn't probably mean anything to you, except um, just making the point that grammatically in the Hebrew grammar, there's something I think that tips us off. Grammatically, the indication is that the Lord is the one who is causing the action to come to pass. It's not Abram who's going to get to a certain place where he's going to say, hey, this place looks great. I mean, there's a lot of grass. There's nice water. We got a view of the mountains. And oh, the breezes are so nice. Let's just settle here. I think I could make my home here. No, that is not what is going on or what is being communicated in the Hebrew text. Um, it is emphasizing the idea that God is in control. A literal translation would be to cause to see or to cause to show. So this is a profound statement to the whole account. The command to Abram to leave all hinges on his belief of the one commanding him. He's putting all his trust into the hands, so to speak, of the one who is speaking to him. Man, that's profound. Because uh, I, um, I don't know about you, but I, before I was going to leave all that and, and, and to take off with my entourage and you know, carve out my people and everything in my household from my father's uh, household, I I think I would want to make sure that uh, I was definitely hearing from God, especially a God that I, at this point in time, knew knew nothing of. Uh, there's no reason for us to believe that Abram ever knew who this God that was speaking to him is. As a matter of fact, the text tells us that there is no indication for us to even think that Ur in Ur, that Abram was a God follower, that he was uh, seeking out the God who made heavens and the heavens and the earth, or the, the God who called Noah to build the ark. Uh, by this time, we have uh, pagan societies that are already being established and built up, as we've already seen in uh, the... Um, the issue regarding Babel, where we had people who were building a tower to make a name for themselves instead of focusing in on doing what God has called them to do. So pagan religion had already started to, to, uh, to build, to grow, and, and to be implemented in society and culture. And so uh, this was certainly happening in Ur. But we have no indication that prior to God speaking to Abram in Haran, that Abram had any idea who this God was and is. Uh, so uh, this is a profound moment where God is speaking to Abram and emphasizing that he will be the one who will show him where he is going. Uh, life and faith is like that, by the way, Christian. Just remember this. Um, you and I sometimes have to do the same thing. We're not able to see in front of ourselves, but what we do uh, see is the God who has revealed himself in the scriptures is a God who calls us to faith, to trust him, to believe in him, not only in his gospel, but in his sovereignty over our lives, that God is at work, that he is the one who is bringing to pass his plan and his purpose in our lives. And um, quite frankly, uh, it is something that, uh, can be very uncomfortable in our lives. As a matter of fact, most of the time it is. God often pushes us or calls us to go in those places that are beyond our comfort zone and to a place where we have to trust and rely upon him to be with us, to, to open doors for us, to create ministry opportunities. And ministry opportunities is not only the thing that God is concerned with. He's also doing things in our lives um, to minister to us by his Holy Spirit. But in all of life's journeys, uh, we are still trusting in the God who, who calls to us and says, trust me, um, 
it is the God who calls us to put our faith in Christ and to believe by faith and to live out our Christian life by faith alone. So not much has really changed. And we see this happening in the life of Abram. And God is the one who will show Abram uh, where he is planning to take him. So the command to Ab- Abram to leave all hinges on his belief in the one doing the commanding. The future of Abram's life is dependent on believing in the words, I will show you. I will show you. I mean, I, I probably would have been one of those guys that, you know, would have opened up my atlas and said, here, uh, could you just point to the place on the map uh, where I'm going? Just so I have some kind of idea to make sure that I'm make, making all the right turns and going to the exact place where you want me to be. Um, no, God is calling Abram to live a life where he is consciously aware of God being in control, that the Lord is the one who is leading him, the Lord is the one who is guiding his steps, and the Lord is the one who has already planned out what he's going to do in Abram's life. But yet he is calling Abram to live by faith. So um, the Lord's promise to Abram in verses 2 through 3, I will make you into a great nation. The word make, asa, it means to do, fashion, accomplish, make. Notice it is the Lord who is the one carrying out the action of the verb. This is not, Abraham, you're going to do great things. And let me tell you about all the things you're going to do. You will, you will, you will, you will. No, 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 no. God doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, you will hear me emphasize it over and over again as we're going through this section. What we see is God emphasizing, I will, I will, I will, as he speaks to Abram. And he speaks in the context of this covenant. I will, I will, I will, I will be with you. I will make your name great. I will guide you. I will, I will, I will. The initiating work of the covenant is God by himself, for himself, and his purposes is working in Abram's life. So God is the initiator of this. I will make you into a great nation. So it is the Lord who is the one who's going to carry out the action of the verb. This is not the beginning of a divine tribute to Abram. Understand that. Very important. It's not that Abram wasn't a great man. Certainly he was. The Bible includes him in the Hebrew, uh, Hebrews 11 uh, Faith Hall of Fame. He was a man of faith. And the New Testament refers to him over and over again. So does the Old Testament. He is a man of significance. Certainly he is. But understand that he is supporting cast, if you will. God is the star of the show. Christ is his leading actor. And Abraham or Abram is a supporting cast. It is God who is working. It is God who is bringing this to pass. The initiating work of the sovereignty of God to initiate covenant in the life of Abram. Um, and to do that even in our lives through the finished work of Christ, we can see, if we look at the Scripture, how that has come to fulfillment. So it's not at the beginning of a divine tribute to Abram, but this is the Lord making a declaration of his own glory to be revealed in the life of Abram. So the emphasis and the reflection of glory that we will see not only in this account, but in all of Scripture, is the emphasis of God doing His great and wondrous and majestic work, culminating in the person and work of Christ, and God is doing that for His glorification. And He says, I will bless you. Notice we see again, I will. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. God is promising favor on Abram. And he says, I will make your name great. I will make your name great. Again, I will. God is the uh, the noun who is carrying out the action of the verb on behalf of Abram. There's a covenant connection here. God is promising that many will associate Abram's name with greatness. 
You will be a blessing. God is promising that Abram will eventually be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. Again, the emphasis, I will, I will, I will. Even the fact that Abram will be a blessing is still because of the I will of God working in Abram's life and through Abram's life. So, I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. God promises to bless and curse others in accordance to how they treat Abram. This is key to many of the future accounts regarding Abram. And all and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God promises, top of 38, God promises to bless all the families of the earth through Abram. And we don't have time today. We need to stop right here. We'll pick it up at the top of page 38 as we'll begin looking next time we're together at what the New Testament says about some of this terminology. You will see that as we go to Galatians chapter 3, that we will see that the Apostle Paul taps back into these covenant promises as he talks about the gospel and the New Testament believer's place in Christ. I hope you've enjoyed this journey today, and I hope you're looking very, very forward to this uh, time that we spend studying the life of Abram or Abraham, the covenant man. He is truly our father in the sense of our spiritual relationship through Jesus Christ and that it is through him that we have an inheritance and the blessings of Abraham come to us even as Gentiles because of our father Abraham and those covenant blessings being fulfilled in the person and work of Christ. May God bless you and have a wonderful day.